Welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, which is titled New Solutions for Quality Monitoring and Performance Management. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating, uh, fascinating webinar. Today's agenda, delighted to be joined by Martin Hill Wilson and Simon Thorpe. Uh, Martin, uh, well known to you on a number of uh, webinars we've done over the last, uh, last couple of years, is going to be taking, taking us through six ideas for new solutions for quality monitoring and performance management. Uh, also, we'll then move on to Simon Thorpe from Nexidia, who will be giving us a further uh, six more ideas of how we can improve quality monitoring and performance management. So, uh, uh, good afternoon to you, Martin. Hello, good afternoon, John T. And good afternoon to you, Simon. Hi, John T. How are you? Very good. We're all sharing one uh, audio connection, so it uh, says speaker John Pierce, but that could be any one of us coming through. Uh, we then follow up top tips from the audience and then interactive questions and answers. Uh, where you can send in your uh, questions. So, but before we go, I just want to share with everyone a poll, which is how many calls do you monitor per agent per month? So, I'd just like to vote on there. The answers are 0 to 1, 2 to 4, 5 to 6, 7 to 10, or 11 plus. So, I'd just like to uh, make your choice there now. Simon, any guesses for which one you think is going to come up? I would guess probably somewhere four or five. Um, I'm hedging a bit there, but um, I, I'm so far to six is probably going to come up the top. Yeah, four to five is a bit, it's quite a hedge. <laughs> yeah, somewhere between one and eleven, I think. <laughs> so let's see if the answer, answer those between, uh, uh, between one and eleven. Let's just share the, uh, share the voting. I was right. Whether I mean, or not. <laughs> Oh, interesting. That's quite a quite an interesting thing. So now that's the sort of how many calls you, you monitor. What I'd like to do is just ask a supplementary question on that, which is when things get really busy, how many calls do you really monitor? So these are during the busy period. So uh, when things get busy, how many do you monitor then? So the answer is again, not to one, two to four, five to six, seven to ten, eleven plus. So the answers are coming in here. Ah, I'm seeing a, a little bit of a little bit of a skew here, Martin. Uh, I'm just going to a few more votes coming. I'm just going to share the uh, share the answers up on the up on the screen here. Ah, um, so we've seen a, the 11 plus has certainly dropped back quite significantly. Yeah, and yeah, a big shift yeah. from five to six to two to two to four there. So I mean, it it kind of it says really that's the amount of disposable capacity that most people have got yeah. for that activity. It's a busy environment. I think that's probably one of the key points really. We all know it's a good thing. Where do you find the time? Yeah. So if anyone that there has got say over over you know seven to ten uh, or eleven plus there when you're busy, it'd be interesting if you could just drop drop down in the question box there how you can manage to do that. Uh, and if you've got any tips to uh, share, 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 share with, with the audience on, uh, <laughs> um, on on what the uh, what the winning secret is there, so, yeah, uh, that's great. So just um, hide the results of that. So some quite fascinating, uh, quite fascinating mm. feedback coming in already. So now delighted to introduce you, Martin Hill Wilson from Brain Food Tr uh, Consulting, who's going to be taking us through um, some of the feedback from your what you call your P and Q uh, yes. study. Yes. So, uh, Martin, just put the bat on the cross for you there. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here we go. Share my screen. Um, what I would like to take you through is some of the key points, really, um, from the P&Q campaign. Now, I don't know whether or not you've come across this, but I've been working with a lot of people now on really trying to define what the next generation of performance and quality management looks like and because uh, that's a bit of a mouthful we've just reduced it down to being called the P&Q campaign and we've started off with a survey uh, which had about 180 people participate in we've done five events around the country and we've also got a little vibrant LinkedIn group as well and what we're trying to do is to get everybody to contribute their current experience and their ideas for the future and translate that into a, a toolkit, really, that everybody can use to help them move on to doing it better and smarter. And there's been a lot of conversations, and I've picked out, I think, some of the most interesting points 
that have been raised. And these are ones which are probably common experiences, just to give you a little bit of a background to this. Um, and I think they're worth sharing to a broad audience, which is why we're doing it today, basically. So starting off in no particular order, I think one of the most important ideas that we've come across is the notion, obviously, that as you go, people, so they perform. That's a fairly obvious statement, but many of us are still stuck complaining, actually, about the, the spread of very tactical KPIs, which often aren't very customer-focused. Uh, and, of course, it's all about uh, providing the right inputs in terms of what metrics you're going to be taking. So the overall statement is, is a good one from Amanda over at Nationwide, which is make sure that, basically, you line up your goals, your rewards, to drive the behavior that you think you want. So that's really the first point. Next point is equally important, and one which has actually been a very top theme for us, get more of the customer voice into that assessment. Uh, a lot of people are saying that compliance in particular has made it a very inwardly focused activity. We'd like to have the customer be part of that critique. Couldn't agree with you more. And the last point, again, is a, is a good one, which is all about making sure that as you access that, don't try and cheat uh, in terms of that feedback, but make sure it's genuinely representative. And on that point, we've had some uh, comment in from the audience. Uh, I uh, won't uh, mention name here, but uh, one individual said, when there are high call volumes and you have the luxury of monitoring pre-recorded calls, I cho choose shorter calls to manage my numbers. Yeah. So I guess that is a bit of a, a, a workaround uh, on that one. Uh, also a note from uh, Cheryl saying, uh, we have a designated quality team for individuals. Yeah. So that's how they manage to, yeah. you know, just got quite a bit of resource there to do yeah. that. And, and again, often you've got a quality team, you've got a team leader, and then you obviously got people who are the advisors on the front line. And that set of relationships, again, is another critically, critically important one to get right. Uh, so just a little bit more of um, um, a tip, I suppose, here from Ian, who, by the way, is in the audience, a great nod, because he's been a good contributor to the whole discussion. Uh, and I'd asked him in one of the interactions, you know, so how are you practically getting this uh, customer voice happening for you? And what they do, they simply send out a 1,000 completely random selected uh, uh, um, surveys out to their customer base, and that's what they use in order to understand how well they do. That's one point. Another point, uh, actually coming from Jonathan, who's part of, well, actually runs Next City for, for Europe, and this was in answer to, again, an emerging thread in the LinkedIn group, which said, um, I think it was a sales environment, in fact, somebody was saying, how often should we be trying to sample uh, in order to make sure that we've got something that is statistically valid at the end of the day? And we had a few people sort of building this discussion. And um, Jonathan's points here, I think, are, are, are interesting. If you are able to think about it uh, from the point of view of all the communications you make, and you therefore aim to sample 100%, you've got a number of real strong benefits that come out of that. The first one is that you completely get through the discussion, which is quite common. I don't think that what you have picked out as the call that you are going to monitor me on is at all representative of what's happened in the month. Um, that's not fair, um, and a lot of resistance comes through from people, quite rightly, saying you're tr really trying to extrapolate far too much from far too little. So if you've actually monitored everything and you've sampled the whole lot, then actually you have got a, a, a view of the universe. The other thing which is important as well is that there is a technique in the middle of all of this which is a smart way of working, and rather than just necessarily talking all the time to three, you know, taking a sample of three every month for every person, why don't you look to d divert your resource to where you need it? In other words, you're doing exception-based management. And if you're doing exception-based management, then you need the ability to see where the exceptions are actually sitting in the data. And if you sample, you t typically lose uh, what they call the outliers. In other words, the above and under performance mm. as a result of that. John T? Yeah, because on the outliers, Alexandra has uh, put a comment, said it's interesting. Uh, short calls are probably going to be the ones that go well, uh, especially in busy times when reps are, reps are more likely to be stressed. Customer service levels may be lower and calls might not go so well, therefore may take longer. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's a better idea to focus on the longer calls if we're looking to improve our, our customer service. Well, certainly there's this whole conversation in customer service about the fallacy of averages which I think is an interesting point, basically, which is that you can easily say, oh, the service levels are great, but you completely ignore the fact when it's, uh, it's not good. Yeah. Uh, and you end up with a very false statistic and impression of life as a result. Yeah. And then the last point, and I, I absolutely think this is the case, is 
Still, I think the regulator remains unsatisfied with the way that uh, a lot of the industry is responding to some of their uh, regulation. Uh, in fact, there's a general thing coming out at the moment, which is that they've moved the signposts now from just being saying a certain number of things to demonstrating that you have un the customers understood what you've been saying to them. So they continuously redefine their, their, you know, their, their requirements here. And Jonathan's point is a good one, which is actually, if you have listened to the whole base, you've got a much stronger basis of argument to say due diligence mm. at the end of the day. So I think all of those three points are good ones, um, and that's really to do with this whole discussion on sampling. Another point, compliance, which is actually uh, a little bit associated with that last point. This has again been quite important for a lot of people, and it's been interesting to explore why we are so internally focused and so literal uh, in, 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 in trying to do quality assurance. But I was telling a story that actually, if you go and talk to your quality people and the people upstairs in compliance and legal, you may be pleasantly surprised that their impression of what you're meant to be doing and what you've translated it in can be two quite different things. And the comments really that um, Anna was making here is to do with the fact that really you've got to get a balance in there and that you should be looking at it as a guideline rather than a rigid adherence at the end of the day. Otherwise, you're missing the point. I, don't, I think if I can just chip in there, I think it's really important to find a way of building a relationship with, with that department, whoever's setting that framework, because we talk to a lot of people and they're saying, well, these people sit a completely different place to us. We maybe not have any kind of relationship with them. If you can try and engage with them yeah. and build that relationship, you might find that there might be some flexibility or, or different ways of doing things that you thought maybe were about a barrier in the first place. And certainly the FSA's perspective is they issue guidelines. They are not being prescriptive. They want to make sure you're doing it thoroughly. But actually, there's a huge area of translation of that, mm. which most people forget. There's some wiggle room there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So there's that thing there. Correct. Another point, um, which is a uh, actually one I I think is a really really significant one from Craig, and he, and he was saying, listen, from the perspective of really wanting to drive through a positive customer experience, you're at the end of the day wanting brand values to be translated in terms of communication and interaction by the people who you have recruited. Now, that's not necessarily going to happen, uh, irrespective of your training in industry, which is another point, by the way. You need to make sure you're recruiting the right kind of people. Um, and I think that that's not a bad thing. As the standards of service continue to rise, as our appreciation of the importance of customer service continues to move on, it stands to reason that the profile of people we're recruiting into our industry should be correspondingly moved on. And I think it's a good... It's a good uh, soapbox that Craig makes there, and it's worth going back, having a look at that to make sure that we've actually got it as an appropriate type of person. And the last point is critical. Make it into something that people relate to as a career rather than just as a nine-month activity. And we've had a comment from uh, Roy says, we have a, a guideline that talks about protecting our brand, which is one of the yes. things, and uh, our folks are trained on this, and it's part of our metric scoring as well to Excellent. reflect the, the brand in the people. I mean, that actually is social customer service grows. That's going to happen even more. Yes, absolutely. You know, and one, one sort of can, uh, piece of detail, really, again, from uh, Avis saying, and by the way, don't forget the team leader in that general point about the right people. They have an incredibly important role. Now, team leader, I would also add on quality team as well there. Anybody that's providing the, in, the input to improving a person's performance, that's an incredibly important role. We've seen a whole change from a more administrative type of person occupying that role to being somebody who's much stronger on interpersonal and coaching skills. We've seen a huge, it's still in play, that transformation, I think, mm. actually. Uh, and, and again, getting the right people there is, 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 is completely one of the links in making sure your performance and quality works effectively. And it, there was a great point uh, at one of the sessions, I think it was up in Leeds, that someone mentioned it's really important to get the P&Q framework embedded into people's minds right from the beginning of the, of the agent life cycle. So when you've recruited them in, so that they're bought in and they understand it right from the very first yeah. beginning. Yeah. I think it's a really important point. Yeah, yeah. Now, actually, builds perfectly that. Coaching, how important that is. Uh, and again, sometimes this obsession about we must do X number a month really supersedes the fact that what we're trying to do is an output. And uh, again, a nice practical point here from Paul saying, look, we do need to do compliance, but actually that's a different mindset. That is a tick box exercise. We're fine with that. We now run that as a quite separate and distinct activity. So we know we're not we're complying. We've got an audited trail as far as that's concerned. Now, 
once that's out of the way, what are we then trying to do? We're now trying to improve behavior in people. Tick boxing doesn't really inform anybody as far as that's concerned, nor does a score, so we've gotten rid of that. What we're concerned about is the quality of a conversation with you yeah. and coaching you towards doing that better. Yeah. And uh, I think that's great. No, I think that's absolutely that's sort of, because quite often, you know, if you're doing a tick box, that's about sort of the hygiene standards, yeah. not about the, the quality of the uh, yeah. quality of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and similarly, we've had a comment in from uh, Jody who says, we do side-by-side -side coaching. This way, we understand the challenges advisors face and can seek service improvement. Call recording shows soft skills, but do we really want to encourage a better running commentary style? when we should be looking to remove the blocks and challenges. Yeah. So yeah. Quite, a, quite an interesting feedback there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think the point is not to be too prescriptive in this process. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're nitpicking at, at, at the small numbers, and say you, you target and someone misses it by 2%, it can be really demotivating. We're looking for ongoing improvement. That's really the key for this. It's sustained on, uh, ongoing improvement. That's where I, I think we've got to be really careful with. Somebody else was talking to me in a slightly different context on social metrics, actually, and they're saying, look, I'm, I, I never actually have absolute targets. I have trends. I'm trending towards zero. I'm trending towards 100. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Uh, and again, some of the conversations from the more advanced people we've discussed, it's all about self-management. It's all about changing behavior. It's all about an ongoing process. It's much less rigid about getting to a certain number, doing a certain thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been more intelligent and grown up, particularly when you've got this notion of empowerment engagement, which is what we're just looking at here, uh, coming from Michelle, really you don't need to box things up in, 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 in the same sort of stuff. So really, performance and qual quality is very much a culture thing. You know, The way that you do it is a function of the culture you're in, mm. and how prescriptive it is or how fluid it is and how valuable it is does depend on all those particular things as well. And this is just an obvious comment, but it is worth reminding ourselves that nobody's going to learn unless they feel incentivized to learn. No. Uh, and you can just imagine some situations, what happens, what happens, where you go through the routine, tick box, nothing substantial as yeah. a result yeah. of it, <laughs> apart from an administrative function. Yeah. Um, so again, the, 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 the skill particularly of team leaders and quality teams to encourage people to want to learn, again, that's extremely important. And just on that point, Martin, uh, uh, someone made a great point when we were when we we're on the road shows that quite often performance and quality can have some negative connotation to it. So it's really important that people understand the value of what you're trying to achieve with that, and people are bought into it. Because if people think that you're there to trip people up, then it's straight away you're going to lose that emphasis of right. trying to penalising people yeah, rather right. than yeah. Yeah. catching yeah. people out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think so. Absolutely right. So it comes down to another level uh, again. Uh, Steve came up, I think, was an interesting thing uh, listening to that interview that you did where he said he was just about to go and see someone the following day, I think. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it comes down to, to this ability to give agents and teams the ability to try and take a bit of ownership in, in, in their own self-development and play a part in, in creating this performance management and quality structure and, and giving people the opportunity to chip in and say when things are, are, are not going as well as they should be and, 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 and play a part in, in that whole infrastructure that you try to develop. So we'll give a little shout out because I think one of the firms that have played a great role and have been very uh, vocal, uh, Motability. Fantastic. Uh, and, and, and again, I think that um, um, Steve certainly knows of them and, and they've been participating with us and they've really done a very interesting thing if you've yet to hear their story. Um, whereby the agents uh, volunteer the cases. You know, they actually have got the confidence and they've got the culture going there that they will bring to the table the things that they want to express and explore. Now, that's probably quite a leap for a lot of us in terms of how you actually achieve that. So one of the things they're offering at the moment is come and see us. I think they've got a place down in Bristol, a place down in London, I think it is. Yeah. Um, and um, that they are more than open to, to allowing other people to come and see how they've actually managed to achieve it. It's a great story. It's one of those, yeah. if you're going to see any call centre in the next 12 months, check them out because I think they're a good, 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 got a good thing going right now. Yeah, and certainly, you know, visiting other organisations doing this type of thing is is very, uh, very powerful. Last week we were looking at first contact resolution. It was, you know, why don't you go out, get out and start to see not necessarily contact centres but other industries like manufacturing industry to see how they have an approach to, to quality. Idea. So, you know, yeah. different, you don't always have to think within the, uh, totally within the sector. Yeah. yeah, totally agree, totally yeah. agree. Um, here was a great little tip from Tina over at the Solicitors Regulatory Authority. And this is, for me, uh, all part and parcel, by the way, of performance and quality 
What's the point of evaluating unless you fix it? And often we get too busy to fix it. So this is a celebration of reducing something down to a simple, doable format in a busy environment. Uh, Simon, I'll let you <laughs> talk it through. Uh, well, we love this because this was, uh, this was a, a thing that they'd come up with as a group and it was do it, dump it, do it better and do it less. And this was a continually evolving process to really assess what were the right things to do. It was fully bought into by everyone in the, uh, the organisation and, and everyone could have their, their, their point come across in terms of what they should do and, and what, which things to take out and spend better time in the, in the correct areas. So really great initiative. And, um, and Tina made the point, you've got to keep doing this. You can't just do this once. You've got to continually evolve through this uh, and make sure that people are brought into Because the place. decisions about, sorry, John, the decisions about when to do it and when to dump it actually change over time, which yeah. is the other thing she said. Which so, is so it's this an either or, you do it or dump it, or yeah. you do it and dump it. So a situation turns up and you've got four, I mean, four, cool. four responses. Cool. Let's start doing it. Yeah. Let's quit doing it. Let's get better at it or we really are over-engineering it, let's do it less well. So it's sort of one of four. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Fantastic. And, uh, it's really worked. It's really worked for us. Nice little, nice little story. Um, and here's another part on this sort of involving people, um, coming from, from uh, the folk over at First Direct. And I think this is, a, this is a, a really actually quite important part of making things work. And that is getting the idea across that we are all responsible, wherever we are and whatever our role is in an organization, to do the right thing for the customer. And um, in their particular thing, um, they, they have this approach to, to encouraging people to be brave to do the right thing. You know, you may well find you get yelled at because you haven't hit your something or your something, but you know in the particular instance that's the right thing to do. So that's another aspect of encouraging courage, really, at the end of the day, is, is another manifestation of empowering uh, your team. Last one comes from me, looking remarkably happy. <laughs> as, as, as Jonty says, it's my same Steve... Same outfit on today, haven't you? I have indeed. It's my Steve Jobs look. <laughs> <laughs> it's my attempt to look young. And uh, my idea would be to, to, to really combine two things. As, as people know, you know I'm a, I am, a, I am a, um, an open fan of analytics. I am also a fan of humans as well. And I think that you can blend these two worlds together. And I think a very practical approach would be to do what I've just said there, actually, which is that you use the advisors to generate the hypotheses. Because I think everybody in Next City will say there's no point just pushing the button. You actually need some intelligence deciding where to point the, the capability. And that's hypothesizing at the end of the day. Now, the people are best placed to do that are the people listening to customers day in, day out. Mm. So they could be an extremely interesting source of that. Now, if you follow that through, not everything's going to be fantastic and work out and actually be an emerging trend you want to pursue. And actually, some of the things that then are emerging trends, you won't necessarily take forward as something you want to exploit in the rest of the business. But if it all manages to get through those various stages and hoops at the end of the day, then maybe there's some extra bumps or some recognition in it for those uh, advisors who originally suggested that. Now, that's a really interesting notion because then suddenly the call center becomes this asset to the rest of the business. And if you're working there, you don't feel you're sitting at the bottom of the ladder any longer. You're actually in a huge point of influence for the rest of the organization. Mm. So I'd love that to come about over the next couple of years. So that's my, that's my fantasy tip <laughs> for, 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 for the rest of them. And that's, I think, what, that's it, really, don't you? Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks for that. Uh, we've had some uh, quite interesting comments from the uh, audience. Seamus has said, um, what call center in, near Bristol should I go and visit to uh, ah, get some ideas? Motivability. Motivability. As it so, um, but also, if anyone in the audience is open for sharing their, you know, visits to their contact center, you'd like to let us know, and um, we can hopefully put people in touch if they want to. Um, Absolutely. I guess, uh, you know, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Indeed. Um, that's always been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, go to a, another poll now. Um, what we want to now do is we'd like to uh, drill down on uh, uh, what challenges do you face in improving quality monitoring and performance management. So just want to um, put that up on the, uh, up on the screen here. Uh, it's a multiple uh, answer one, so you can vote on more than one answer. So are the challenges uh, measuring the right things, the challenges that we're too busy, uh, that people have low trust in the process, so um, things like calibration, I guess, could fit into there. Yep. Uh, team leaders need better skills, better coaching skills. Yep. Um, or that you don't have the technology you need or the, uh, or the, the technology 
uh, won't let you do what you'd like to uh, like to do. So just yep. like to vote on you know all of those that apply to uh, your organisation uh, will be quite uh, quite good. I'm looking at the uh, display here. It's a bit like a horse race. There's quite a number <laughs> that are actually quite uh, quite closely linked. Ah, but we have got one that's uh, one that's pulling away. So uh, uh, Martin, any any? Well, I'm going to guess it's going to be too busy. Ah, well. Different answer. Oh, the actual answer is oh. we're too busy. Actually, comes in comes in third. Oh, uh, actually, the biggest challenge that people have measuring got there the right things. is measuring the right things, followed by team leaders needing needing better skills. Interesting. Uh, strangely enough, though, I hear a lot of this. The the low trust in the in the process comes comes uh, so much. comes mm. down. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to drill down on that a little bit more. And what I'd like to do is ask the question of the audience, saying, "Which or what is your biggest problem you face in improving quality monitoring and performance management?" And that may be something that wasn't on our list. So, if you just like to, in the question box on the right-hand side, just write in now, "What is your biggest problem you face in improving quality mo monitoring or performance management?" Mm. Interesting. So if you just like to wrap that into the box, we're getting the first uh, answers coming through. Alexander said, getting uh, information from our technology is certainly a challenge he faces. Uh, uh, Gareth has said it's budget. Uh, Lisa has said, keeping team ma members engaged. Mm -hmm. Jürgen has said, uh, find time uh, to action any findings we've got. Yeah. Uh, Sarah said, teams are too big. Uh, division between supervisors and the QA team. Ah, uh, Sarah said uh, getting in the buy-in for everyone. Uh, Roy said, you know, what's the, what's the payoff? Yes. What an interesting one. Uh, Grace said agents are not uh, receptive to coaching. Mm. Uh, mm. Lee similarly unmotivated handlers. Mm. Uh, Sarah said everyone. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me just pick up on a few bits in there to do with the not. Um, people not listening and not getting value. One of the things is that if you can't, if it's hard to get feedback, find the right stuff, typically you're not able to find enough detailed evidence to give good quality feedback to inspire you to think, oh yes, you're right, I should change. Yeah. So it's the lack of being specific that means you get blah training, blah coaching, and people go, yeah. well, what's the point? So that's another argument for actually having a much better mousetrap. Yeah, and I'd also say in that it makes it really difficult for coaches if they don't feel like they've got anything credible. It makes it really difficult to approach that coaching environment if you if you don't feel like you've got anything really insightful to say. Well, you get you end up with a sweetie culture. Yeah, yeah, which is basically I'll give you some more waste fattening substances yeah. in order to improve your performance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Russ says uh, rep C quality monitoring monitoring is being more punitive. Consistency is a, yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Chantal has said uh, quality quality monitoring skills for the Quality team. Yes, that's yeah, quite, yeah. In, quite interesting. Yeah. That's a bit uh, uh, interesting. Not knowing what to measure and what form style to use. How many calls to monitor? What type of calls to monitor? So that's quite an interesting. If anyone's got any answers to that, put those into yeah. the question box. Yeah. Or indeed, on our chat room is yeah. also a good place to discuss those. Uh, which, if you wanted to go to the call, the chat room is callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. And there's been a couple of questions asked in there already. Um, Simon, advisors dealing with change. We've changed our quality guide uh, guidelines. Many advisors have been with us for years. Mm. So that's sort of... Well, it raises another question, by the way. A lot of people have never questioned why they're doing it and what they're measuring. So picking up on the theme of people that find it, it frustrating that they're not measuring the right things, it might be because you haven't systematically reviewed the whole of your performance and quality system and said, what are we doing this for? And what are the major goals that we're meant to be pursuing connected to the business goals? And that translates down then on the focus we're giving to performance and quality. Yeah. And a lot of people don't do that, and they just assume they should do what they did last year, and it actually loses relevance. Yeah. I mean, the world out there is very different from 25 years ago when we built these systems. If you yeah. think about it, we've got to review them regularly. We're seeing a lot of ones coming through now about calibration and consistency. Okay. Yeah. Agents being consistent with quality improvement and trying to push uh, too much onto them at one time, uh -huh. uh, trying not to push too much onto them, yeah. uh, getting scores close to the reality. Currently our team leaders are overscoring our agents. 
the quality score is being linked to the wage of the advisors. Ah, oh, we're gaming yeah. the system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really going to thing. Yes. Uh, lots of other ones about uh, time and resource uh, and a number about top management. Uh, uh, top management. Uh, oh, you're going to catch up that into one of your famous posts. That will all uh, all come through and be Sorry, published in the next, uh, probably just over over the Easter over the Easter break. That'll be very interesting. Wonderful. Well, thanks uh, very much for everyone in the audience. Uh, again, uh, callcenterhelper dot com forward slash chat if you want to uh, chat uh, amongst other members of the uh, members of the audience. So, just like to um, now move across to Simon Thorpe, and Simon's going to take us through a few more ideas about how you can improve your uh, uh, quality monitoring and performance management. So Simon, if you'd just like to pop your slides up on the screen. Shall. There we go. Hopefully we can see that. Okay, thank you, John C. Um, so I'm going to try and lead on from that poll a little bit and um, talk a little bit about how technology can play a part in the future of performance and quality management. But in particular, uh, the role of speech and interaction analytics. Um, Martin did a, a lovely segue there uh, for us in terms of some of uh, some of the things that we've been talking about, um, and hopefully I'm going to try and pick up a, a little bit uh, from uh, from his points. But before we get there, I just wanted to try and summarise um, what we've come across as some of the challenges uh, to do with performance and management. As we talked about, Martin um, and I have been running around the country doing these uh, PQ Roadshow events. Um, talking to lots of really fantastic people about some of the challenges, some of the ways the industry should move forward. Um, and I think from our experience, one of the overwhelming core challenges for most is the fact that most companies have a very manual and expensive process and one which takes a huge amount of time in terms of the call evaluation process. So as we saw in the poll earlier, I think a lot of organizations usually use sampling of around five calls uh, per agent per month. So what does that mean in terms of having what I would say is a fairly low sample size? Well, I think you typically get a couple of problems there. Um, I think the first of which is if, you've got, if your net isn't particularly big, it's not far reaching, how do you know whether you haven't missed anything, any kind of key performance changes or issues? Um, and if you've got low sample size, is that going to then mean that you've got low credibility? Um, and we talked a little bit about that in respect to some of the coaching. So if your net isn't big enough, how do you find performance issues uh, and behaviors from the agents in the first place? And if you're lucky enough to find something that needs to change, what's the probability of finding that again to see whether the coaching has taken effect? And from that, you can start seeing other issues like, as we talked about, agents saying coaching and evaluation isn't fair, general training and, and, and coaching become very, uh, very generic. And a lot of organizations have, have um, through my experience, have told us it's really difficult to drive any kind of real change. And I think from the last uh, few months, we've definitely seen an appetite for a, uh, a, a shift towards a, a new way of working. Um, I've put up a slide here, which um, I think, John, to you referenced on, uh, on, on Call Center Helper, which I think encapsulates this really nicely in terms of the sentiment to move into a new dimension. Um, and really, what we've seen is a, a huge drive and a huge aspiration to move to a more customer-focused view of performance and quality. We talked about that a little bit before in terms of absolutely getting the voice of customer into uh, any kind of framework. And there seems to be a, a need and, and shift to, away from this kind of heavily KPI-driven, heavily metric-driven operational function. And what we'll do is we'll also put a link to that uh, article. Uh, which I think was published in January yeah. uh, on the website, so if people want to... Uh, and that was a great piece, so yeah I'd, yeah, I'd urge everyone to have a look at that. Definitely seen a lot of movement um, towards uh, a, a more collaborative um, and sort of positive coaching culture. Um, I think someone mentioned on one of the, uh, the replies before about it being very punitive, adversarial in terms of that, that, that culture. There's definitely a, a desire to move away from that. Um, and absolutely we see a lot of people saying how important it is to make sure that everyone is brought in, whether that's top down, and you know, everyone within the organization needs to understand what we're trying to achieve with performance and management, uh, and absolutely understand the value, and, and also feel a part, feel like they're playing a part in uh, and what it's all about. So what does that look like um, from a visual? Well, uh, typically, from our experience, we see contact centers with total call recording, on average five calls per agent per month in terms of evaluations, which quite often is less than a percentage 
of calls available for coaching, which is a staggeringly low number, a really staggeringly low number. So I suppose the question I'm asking here is, should we really be making business decisions that affect the customers based on such a low sample? And really, that's where I'd argue um, we should be looking at an, uh, another way. And this is really where uh, interaction analytics and, uh, and, and technology can really start playing a part. So I'm now uh, going to ask everyone to uh, take part in a poll. OK, I'm uh, just going to put the uh, poll up on the screen now. Uh, the poll is, do you use already uh, speech analytics? Do you use speech analytics? The uh, answers are quite, uh, quite straightforward. Oh, I've, lost my, uh, <laughs> I've lost my poll here. Missing the uh, COVID action. Ah, here we are. There we go. Come back. Sorry, operator error. Um, do you already have speech analytics? Uh, is the question. We already have it. We're considering it. We've got no plans, or we're not sure. So just like to uh, vote on that. And uh, be quite interesting to see the uh, results. So I'd like to say we've been joined by Jonathan Wax from uh, uh, Nexidia. Uh, Jonathan's the v the VP for EMEA. Uh, Jonathan, any predictions on? Uh, on uh, what percentage of people you say would already have speech analytics in the audience? I'm not allowed to say between 0 and 100, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Under 10. Under 10 percent. Yeah. Right. Let's have a look. Uh, 23% already. Uh, audience, actually quite uh, quite low there. 7 7 percent. 7 percent. 23 percent seems to be uh, uh, considering currently. 44 percent have no plans and 26% uh, not sure. So Interesting. Uh, certainly okay. I've been saying for years that speech analytics is one of two uh, very interesting technologies to uh, to watch. So it's quite interesting to see that starting to uh, become, I think, what I'd call early majority phase yeah. now rather than yes. I think that's 7%. That's about what we expected. So let's uh, put that back to you then, Simon. Thank you. So hopefully that's... We just can we see that? that? We can indeed, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what that means um, in terms of analytics from the point of view of performance management. Um, and I think when we're, when we're looking at PinQ, we've really got to start thinking about um, what are the questions or changes or improvements we're trying to, uh, to drive. So uh, what I've put down, to, down the left-hand side is, is some typical questions that I think people ask. It's things like, how are we interacting with customers? Are we hitting our customer service metrics? Are we going to be completely compliant? Um, who are the agents that are struggling? And, uh, and how, do we, how can we help them and, and offer them that support? And what I found um, over, the, uh, over my uh, experience is that, that very few organizations can answer those, uh, those questions with any real depth or detail. And really, this is where analytics starts playing its part, because by analyzing 100% of all customer interactions, you can really start drilling into what is important. I think you can start then creating real meaning to your coaching, and hopefully we can start driving uh, and improving some agent behavior. And I think it's important to make the point that it's not just um, about the traditional phone channel. Um, I put this slide up because I think um, when we were doing the performance and quality uh, events, part of the survey, we asked people which channels they were offering to their customers. No great surprises there that, that phone and email came up on top. But in terms of what they evaluated uh, and, and put some, some uh, performance quality metrics behind, that was actually a little bit more surprising. And with the emerging channels, there certainly was a, a disconnect with, uh, with, with, with what people were looking for. So key point here really is, same rules apply. Um, consider performance and quality across all all channels that you're offering, and random sampling and uh, and those sort of things may give you uh, the same low credibility and in, uh, in the same respect. So, interaction analytics, and this is why I'm, I'm talking about interaction analytics rather than just speech analytics, really has a part to play there. So. I'm just going to quickly show you what this looks like um, in terms of interaction analytics in action. Um, this is one of next city's scorecards, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through a very quick example uh, of what this looks like. So the example I'm going to show here is a communications business. They've established that their agents aren't using the, 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 the proper troubleshooting methodologies before sending a technician to a home. 
So you can see on the uh, on the top of the, the screen here, we've got some uh, some quality initiatives that we're looking at. We've got our, like, our agents here as well. And the result of, of not of sending technicians out so early without going through some of these steps meant customers were having to wait a long time to get their, their problem resolved. So there was some dissatisfaction there. But obviously the, the process of sending out technicians was also becoming very, very expensive for the business. So what they did, they used analytics to identify a problem first and foremost. And they were able to do that because they'd analyzed all of the calls, not just a, a random sample. But what they needed to do now was start looking at which agents needed help and coaching to start driving and improving some of those behaviors. So the point to make here is by using analytics, we can automate one of the most labor intensive parts of the process. By sampling, we would have struggled to find which agents uh, were having any problems. And we'd also spend a huge amount of time doing some manual call listening to get there in the first place. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is it wouldn't be fantastic if we can reduce the amount of time QM teams and supervisors spend listening to calls in favor of doing specific targeted coaching and spending time with agents. And so really with this example, what I'm showing is that we've got a chap here, Charles, he's got some problems, he's in the red. Uh, so straight away we can do some targeted and focused coaching for him. We can start looking at some of our best performers uh, and pulling out some of that, that, that great work and hopefully using that to reinforce some, uh, some positive change with others. We can link uh, some of the agents together. So if we've got some, uh, some people with the, and the same problems, we can uh, do some, some shared coaching for them. And I think really the reason I put this up here is that we had a fantastic quote from, uh, from someone in the PMQ group, which was this one that's appeared on the bottom here about reducing the delta between the best and worst. The most expensive part of running a contact center, as we all know, is the people. So if there was a way of reducing that bracket between the best and worst, that would hopefully have a, a really positive impact on performance. And really, I just wanted to show you a couple more uh, examples of what this looks like in terms of automating the process. Um, so we talked a bit about relevance and supervisors having some real substance to what they're trying to coach. Now that's really, really difficult if you're looking for that proverbial need in a haystack call to reinforce a coaching point. And so once you've found that call, wouldn't it be great if you could go straight to the point in that, at that call and, and also find multiple calls so you can reinforce that coaching point. So if we remember Charles from the, uh, the previous slide, we can sit down with Charles now, we can play all of his calls through with him, we can really start um, drilling into points of the call to uh, emphasize he needs to uh, uh, work on certain uh, certain behaviors. We can maybe play him back some, uh, some best practice calls as well. Uh, but the point here is that we can try and alleviate this whole uh, legitimacy issue and this, get past this whole point of agents saying, well, hold on a minute, you just picked one of my bad calls. 99% of the rest of my calls are fantastic. Straight away, they may not realize that there's a problem, but we can start reinforcing some points by playing. And I think, John, so you mentioned there was a lot of uh, questions about uh, calibration, Indeed, and, calibration and fairness. The, um, I think that's a key, key part of any performance and quality structure. Um, agents, I think, absolutely need to be brought into the idea that it's not just Big Brother waiting for you to trip up. It's really there to give value and to add support and help a, a, an advisor or agent do the best for the customer and the organization. So I think fairness is a key part of this process and I've just shown you uh, a quick example of, uh, of what that looks like from a, uh, a point of view of our technology. The ability to be able to automatically evaluate how supervisors are evaluating and uh, give the agents the opportunity to review that back and, and say whether they disagree with some of the evaluations. And absolutely finally, um, just to talk through a little bit about empowerment and self-assessment, I think personally this is the key point. People need to be brought into the process, but they also need to have the ability to take some ownership of their own development. Certainly seen far more motivated people when they feel like they've got a part to play. And using technology um, can certainly help. These are a couple of ways that we do it. We, uh, we can give uh, organizations the opportunity to let advisors log in and review some of their calls. Supervisors can send uh, some calls to listen to. They can uh, have a look at their evaluation uh, scores. They can really genuinely take ownership and request coaching and, and have a, a greater part to play in their own self-development. So that's just a quick snapshot of, uh, of, of, of the technology in action. Uh, so back to you, John. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And certainly on the 
a comment of uh, empowerment and uh, self-assessment, Michael has said, we've gone from a tick sheet to marking down from 100% 100% into a coaching environment. Right. And totally changed the, the quality monitoring. So getting the advisors to buy into the change we're trying to achieve. So I think it's, it's definitely uh, well, that's you know, right about, to hear, yeah. uh, uh, empowerment and, uh, and self-assessment. So thanks very much for that, uh, Simon. We're going to go now on to uh, top tips from the uh, from the audience, and um, uh, it's your chance to send in your top tips. We've had a number sent in uh, so far. Uh, odds of winning the spot of champagne much higher than winning the uh, the national lottery, <laughs> uh, and we uh, we do ship uh, internationally. We've sent uh, quite a number to uh, uh, international locations. We had a comment uh, last week about people some worried about our postage costs. Uh, I think we've got one of the biggest champagne uh, bills, and I never get a chance to drink any of it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go into some of the some of the questions that have been sent in uh, so far. Uh, Nicolette uh, has said, "Involve the rep in the mo monthly evaluation of his or her calls. Inform inform the rep from day one on on how his or her performance will be evaluated." Yeah, Absolutely agree a, with that. Quite a good one there. Uh, Jody, interesting comment here. We encourage the use of learning journals within the team. Martin, I've not come across this one before. Advisors are encouraged to share ideas for improvements and rewarding for doing so. This is um, this is taken out of L and D, learning and development theory. Oh right. Which is that if you want to embed learning, you yep. get people to write stuff out in much more detail. And it's been applied actually in the ideas of improvements and rewards. It's great. That must be an advanced culture she's talking yeah, about. Yeah. Wow. So if you've got any uh, examples of what that, that looks like, I'd, I'd certainly love to love to see that. Uh, also, we're, uh, going back to Tina that you referenced before, Martin, um, they had a great culture of, of, of mentoring as well in their, uh, mm. their organization. That was a particularly effective um, uh, way of doing things for me. Yeah. Comment from Roy, we do something similar. I'm not quite sure about what, that, what point that was referring to. Uh, we send out randomized customer satisfaction surveys and uh, build that into the wider metrics. We're putting that to ears thousands a month. It is indeed. Well remembered. Uh, Alexander, re regardless of which metrics we track, I found the best methodology is to be open with the team regarding the st statistics that we collect about them. We actually have a relatively small team, so we go over everyone's performance on a weekly basis mm. as a group, mm. and we found that each person holds themselves responsible to achieve more, especially when it comes to the quality of our customer service. Good advanced culture. Indeed, yeah. wonderful. So uh, some quite uh, quite useful stuff there, uh, Alexander. Tips are now uh, starting to uh, flood in. Uh, Mia said, going back to the reward system, we have a monthly drive within our company. Uh, delivery, resolve, initiative, value, and enthusiasm. I don't know if, oh, that, which spells out the words drive, D-R-I-V-E, yes, where team members and managers can nominate someone for going out, out of their way, making a financial reduction or saving the company money, right. or even just coming up with a new idea. The managers can then vote at the end of the month and can be rewarded up to 100, 450 pounds. I hope that's not the managers that get the award. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Love it. Love and uh, Mia, being fascinating to uh, uh, you know, see if there, if there are any, uh, if you could share any of those ideas that have come out of that uh, program. If you could type those into the question box, would be uh, would be great. Oh, another one by Mia. Ask the staff at the end. Of, of each call for customer feedback to take part in the survey. Uh, Sarah said, agents should be able to score their own calls alongside a manager yeah. and discuss for buying. Yeah. Yeah. People are often very self-critical. Simon, I guess that's I don't, uh, That absolutely ties into what I was saying before. I mean, I, I, I absolutely think that the agents should be able to be able to review the, the calls question the way it's been evaluated but this is a little bit more advanced than that and actually be able to be that self-critical and, uh, and, and, and give their own evaluations, fantastic. Yeah, similar from Simon, we have call listening sessions with groups of advisors score, scoring calls themselves and doing advisor calibrations mm. to understand each quality question and discuss hints, tips and suggestions uh, to share best practice. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, uh, sharing best practice, fabulous one there. Whether we're monitoring or assessing agents uh, to team leaders or are the four fronts should be the customer and doing the right thing for the customer? Um, okay. not sure I entirely understand that one. Uh, whether we're monitoring or, or assessing agents to team leaders, oh, I think it's the same question again. Oh. Right, tip, lead by example. Take calls yourself 
and let advisors listen side by side. Now that would be an interesting answer. <laughs> let, let your advisors score you. Yeah, great leadership. I must admit, I get completely uh, flustered when I answer uh, answer calls myself. Be good confidence. <laughs> Uh, another one from Alexander, we are, whether we are monitoring or assessing agents as team leaders. Oh, hang on. We've got a glitch here. Have the team leaders calibrate their calls with us. Let them listen to and tell us how they would grade the call. So yeah, similar, same attitude. Similar one here. Um, we do daily feedback sessions with agents to understand their challenges on the desk and analyze bad calls and good calls. Oh. Certainly, yeah, uh, on a daily basis. Jonathan, you've got a comment on that? Yeah, I was just, just want to pick up on a couple of the views. I think the aim of all of this is really driving consistency, and that consistency is as far as be good behaviours, I'd say. And, and, yeah, one of the things I would say is that when you see organisations migrating from an old way of doing things to a new way, whether they're using technology or not, that the consistency is normally driven by the fact that you don't do monthly coaching sessions. You do far more frequent sessions, so weekly or daily, and you do it in a far more collaborative way than you've done before. So I think there's a whole lot of shift you're trying to do. But you know, the measure is consistency as much as anything else in whatever it is you're measuring. Yeah. We're yeah. going to take a couple of questions in just a, just a minute. Uh, Rachel, on those questions, if you could just increase the font size a bit, that would be great. A um, couple of other questions. I, I like oh, a couple of other comments. I like to have the agent review the case documentation first, then listen to the call. This day, way they can this way they can if the captured information and make sure the feedback is two way. Try to do it bi weekly. So I guess that's you yeah. know very much tied in with yeah. um So that's a that's a question of also checking what they captured in, in, in terms of what they recorded, then listen back to the call yeah. and, and critique it from that point of view as well. Yeah. Now Jonathan this works quite well when you, you've presumably got screen recording happening at the same time as, as the actual call, because you can see what's, what's happening as you're yeah. approaching the... Uh, yeah, you can calibrate that as well. Through it. Yes. Uh, Self-assessment is key to our program. The advisors review their mail prior to the session and allow them to present their findings in a secure... That's great. ...secure mm. environment. Right, I'm going to pick up on a couple of, uh, couple of questions. Are there any good books on QA? I'm new to the job and trying to learn as much as I can. Well, I actually answered Mark on the on the chat window and suggested he went back to the LinkedIn group on that. Yeah, uh, is the quick one. There are there are certainly a lot of people now who've been talking about their approach. We've got 30 videos so far, which is quite yeah. a nice way to absorb some of the stuff. I've never, I must admit, gone to Amazon and tried to hunt down my quality and pee book for Christmas. No, I don't know if it's written. I think the best thing Mark can do is, is get involved and start talking to other people, so either within the LinkedIn group or, or come along to some of the, the, the PQ yeah. events, because the best way of learning is hearing how other people are doing it. I do actually, a serious point, I do think we're, a lot of the comments we've just seen, I think yeah. are really good testament to a, 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 a fantastic change of culture that we've seen in the last couple yeah. of years. Much more collaborative, much more sensitive to the learning requirements yeah. of people. I think that the bit... I would still put in is that the that needs to be put into a commercial context of knowing that you're putting your effort into the relevant parts as far as the customer experience is concerned and the things that you need to be improving. So I think people have got the one-to-one -one bit correct. What they need to be concentrating now is their ability to fish out the relevant stuff. Yeah. So if anyone in the audience knows any good books on QA, it'd be interesting to see. Yep. If not, there's an opportunity for someone. I don't know if that's a, <laughs> for your long wish list, Mark, no, to, write right, the, uh, write to write the handbook on uh, on, <laughs> on the monitoring. It. We are doing a toolbox. Book on, on, <laughs> and whether Jonathan in his spare time, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, plans to write a book on that. But um, uh, and um, Rose's set, set a question: How do you ensure that assessors are aligned when scoring? Currently, our quality team check work that has been monitored for KPI purposes by team managers. This is causing a big divide between our quality team and team managers as they feel that they're being undermined. Has anyone got a calibration process that works Yes, that works well? That's been part of the discussion on the on the chat room. I've lost my session now. But yeah, I've, I've pulled these questions off the yeah. chat room. So, I, I mean, to, to that end, I think you, know, you, you use the right word. It's a calibration process, and it's a, a calibration process. You know, it's, they need to be done, I think, fre frequently, but I agree, you know, frequently and in a constructive way. Because if you've got two groups who are scoring differently, 
you know, you very simply get a few in the room and listen to two or three calls and make them score them quietly, you know, privately, and then share those those what they scored and why they scored, and that's the start of the calibration process. Yeah. And again, you know, it's uh, if, if you have multiple sites, you'll have that same problem. You know, there's all sorts of factors that can scale into it. But it is, it's a, it is, it's one of those ones you just need the people to be scored the same for calls in a yeah. non-hostile type environment. And, yeah. and again, some people have said they've got agents coming as well, or yeah. advisors. What you want. Absolutely, that works as well. It's creating that. Yeah, I guess ultimately you need a. a Potentially, you know, my mother used to score exam papers, uh, A level papers. Yeah. Uh, used to go off to to a, to a you know a calibration committee. Yeah. Yeah. We used to sample the the scoring to to make sure that it was uh, consistent. But picking up the business about people feeling undermined. At the end of the day, that needs to be a negotiated discussion then for people to rediscover what they're doing and why they're doing it, and and we agree what works amongst them uh, because the trust has gone on that. Yeah. Right. We're back to some uh, audience tips. Setting up a document where agents can see their scores on a live basis. If there is a sample of 10 audits per agent, after five audits, they can see their current score and know what it will take to get the remaining five to a score they will be happy with. This will encourage them to improve their quality and be enthusiastic about consistently achieving high scores. This is some like sort a of primitive leaderboard there. Yeah. Yeah. Is this good. Is some sort of real-time real -time systems? I'd be interested to see how they do that. Yeah, certainly. Um, no, yeah, interesting to see that. So, if uh, if Mark has you got any ideas, uh, pop those, uh, pop them in, or, or drop them into the uh, into the chat room. Uh, we send out any conversation point to allow the rep to think about what they want to share when the time comes to discuss the evaluation. So, I guess that's you listen to the calls first, and then you're asking a question of the agent. What do you think? on this particular point. It sounds like they've got an open culture to be able to allow reps to be able to do that. I mean, it sounds like they're, they're not overly structured with it. Interesting. Uh, Fiona, I run monthly sessions where TMs and quality agents listen to the calls yeah. together. Helps make sure they're on the same page. I guess yeah. that's very yeah. similar to the, yeah. uh, the calibration, uh, calibration piece. We have a support team who uses software to escalate systemic failure to the department head concern. Mm -hmm. This gives customer service the opportunity to feedback customer concerns on the wider organization. They feel part of the wider quality quality program. Great. And uh, uh, we use systems thinking, check processes, mm -hmm. to get wider teams. Uh, Judy did comment earlier, yeah. didn't she? Uh, to get wider teams involved and understanding the demand coming into the business and capturing word for word so customers' feedback can be used for service improvement. I'm glad we've brought... Those last two comments are the other part of this whole system, which is that we get value from it, pushing it back to the relevant parts of the business. It's important. Indeed. So I'm afraid that's uh, uh, top tips. We've done some